Hey Booktube, it's Fee. I just finished Battleground and I have feelings about it. Apparently the rest of the internet does too. So we are going to be discovering and discussing topics of conversation on the Battleground mega thread on r slash Dresden Files. The one major spoiler that people keep overlooking. Michael Carpenter swears profusely for several minutes using every single bit of terminology he picked up in his time in the army and swore at the White Council and they deserved it. If they had been there, can you imagine the power of knowing Michael, of all people, thought poorly of you that strongly. Yeah, that part really surprised me. It was actually hilarious. Michael seems like the kind of guy who holds himself to a very high standard. Even though he's not a jerk about it, he's still, I don't know, he's got that vibe. And then he just lets loose and is like, ugh, it was beautiful. You know you've messed up when you've reduced the best of the Knights of the Cross to obscenities and incoherent rage. Bonus points for doing it without interfering with his wife or children. That's a good point. Michael does love his wife and children. Family is like the most important thing to him, besides his whole religion and stuff. Had the senior council been present for Michael's disappointment in them, they would have been shamed into reinstating Harry and apologizing, probably right then and there. It is the real reason they sent Carlos instead of telling him in person. Yeah, I don't know how I should feel about Carlos now. Like that might be a topic discussed later, but I feel like he didn't trust Harry and then they had that whole thing with the black court and then they were buds. I am so disappointed in Carlos. I know he didn't trust Harry for a good bit of both peace talks and battlegrounds, but come on, they fought the black court vampires together. You know Harry's on your side. And then you gotta go and treat him like that at the end. For shame, Carlos. For shame. There is something even more to consider about how badly they effed up by ousting Dresden. Because the entire supernatural world is going to point at them and say, he defended Chicago, he bested a titan, where were you? Because the ones who voted him out, most of them weren't there. Yeah, that was a super sneaky... <sighs> I mean, the White Council has never been all sunshine and rainbows and good vibrations. But at the same time, I feel like this is a new low even for them. We all know that the Black Council, or whatever they're calling the bad guys on the White Council, have been doing their stuff in secret for a really long time. And I don't think we're really, at this point at least, any closer to figuring out who or what is going on. I know that there was that one guy that they outed a couple books ago. But besides that, we don't really know who's complacent in this. But I think that them kicking Harry out of the White Council is really going to come back and bite them. Ousting Dresden, when they did it, and how they did it, and where they did it, is not going to be seen as a sign of strength. The White Council of Wizards just displayed a massive sign of weakness to the entire supernatural community. I think that this shows how divided the White Council is, even though they try to act like all combined and together. Everybody's scared of Harry, but at the same time, if you're going to play power games, you want a guy like Harry in your corner. And telling him to take a hike and threatening him? Nah, that ain't gonna work out well for them. They also planted the seed for a real and true schism to happen in the council. If they order McCoy to take him out, I don't see any way he actually does it. He'll probably defect. <laughs> Nobody wants to go up against the Blackstaff. I know he's very honor and duty bound, but I think the fight at the end of Peace Talks is going to make McCoy think twice about all the things that he just took for granted. And I think that he's going to cherish the second chance that he gets with Harry. Others likely will too. This decision to kick Dresden out is probably going to pay some serious nasty dividends in a few books. And I cannot wait. Ugh, sorry y'all. That just made me really, really mad when they kicked Harry out. I have a feeling that by the end of the series, the White Council isn't going to exist in the way it currently does. Yeah. I don't think things like this can happen and then just have an institution like the White Council stay the same. They're going to try, but it's not going to work for them. The black stuff equals Mother Winter's walking stick. Confirmed. All right, why is McCoy giving Harry so much crap about his relationship with Mab in the Winter Court if he has the walking stick of Mother Winter? Also, I don't understand the reference. I feel like this is something that I need to go back and pay very close attention to as I reread the series. Did anyone else really like Dracula? The man had so much style it wasn't even funny, and I liked the fact that he judged Harry as wanting because of Harry's lack of style. I feel like Dracula is going to be probably our main baddie going forward, at least you know, without all the titans and stuff. He's definitely in a weight class that we haven't seen before. And I thought Mavra was scary. Also the fact that he called the whole event a minor squabble. Lol. Completely unconcerned. Yeah, that's kind of scary. It was very funny to see Harry bugging out and have some older guys saying, okay, this is bad, but it's not like worst day ever bad, you know? Can only imagine the kind of stuff that went down in the old days. Demon Reach's cells didn't fill themselves. Very good point. Honestly, that makes me think of what it would be like to go back in time and have to live in an era without all the technology that we have now. 
that would be terrifying. I like having internet and air conditioning and access to basically whatever I want in a three or four mile radius. I live in a city and I'm mildly spoiled and I'm okay with that. Okay, addressing Dracul a little more and the fight between him and the wardens. First of all, what a fucking entrance. Like, wow. Second, it's obvious that Dracul is definitely more than just a black court vampire. Everyone that we've met was a desiccated corpse, but Dracula was something else entirely. We know he's at least half demon, and is bound to the form he's in, based on things from both in-book and out-of-book stuff. Alright, I feel like there's probably some short stories that I've missed because I don't get the context for this comment. We also know that traditionally, in folklore, vampires aren't visible in mirrors. Harry has mentioned many times throughout the series that a whole lot of creatures can use mirrors as windows or doorways. The next book is purportedly titled Mirror Mirror. Ah, we're gonna get some black cord action. That's mildly terrifying, but at this point in the Dresden Files, what isn't? I think it's entirely possible that the reason the Black Court vampires aren't traditionally visible in mirrors is that they are only windows and doors to them. I also think that there's a very decent possibility that Dracula sent Chandler into the mirror dimension that we will see Harry go to. And we will, hopefully, get to see Chandler take more screen time there. Chandler seemed really charming. He kind of had this whole finishing school vibe to him. I honestly think that he would make a really entertaining Black Court vampire. Because I assume that Dracul was probably on a recruiting mission. Since, you know, he pieced out of the whole thing once Harry kind of busted up his party. But I don't know. It's just a theory. Ooh, I love the idea that Dracul is literally throwing people into Dark Mirror Dimension. That's a neat one. I could see it happening. Could be that the council figures out what happened to Chandler, but tell Ramirez that it's too risky, too close to violating a law of magic to go get him. Enter Warden Boy coming back to Harry saying, You got him thrown down there, you gotta get him out. And then Harry's like, Ugh please. And then Harry tells him to bug off, but still goes to save Chandler because, you know, that's who Harry is. A grudging buddy cop book where Harry comes clean to Carlos about what he had been keeping from him and why. It's not like it can hurt him now. Wizards can't use his relationship with Thomas against him after they kicked him out, and he no longer has a Denarian shadow in his head, so he can tell him about that too. Oh, and he can tell him about the Black Council, and tell him about Murph. Murph. <laughs> Carlos is going to feel like a real shit if Dresden comes clean. Yeah, he better, because none of what he blames on Dresden has anything to do with what Dresden kept from him. Yeah, I agree. I think the whole thing with Thomas was blown out of proportion at the beginning to sort of get things going in the story. Or at least blown out of proportion in respect to how the White Council treats Harry. This really bothered me. Carlos basically blamed Harry for the death of 60,000 people. He said that maybe if he had told him things, it would have helped. But how in the hell is Harry responsible for the Titan and the Eye of Balor? I don't understand where he's coming from on this one. Me too. It didn't exactly make sense. Like, I know Carlos was very distrustful, but at the same time, like, Harry trained him. They've been through the war with the Red Court together. Carlos should know better, and he should know that Harry is on his side. He is grieving and in pain. So he is lashing out at someone he looked up to as a hero, but has come to see as human. Carlos is where Butters was in Skin Game. He sees Dresden running around with monsters and is afraid that he might become one of them. I think Harry is also kind of afraid of what he's going to become. If we go back to that scene with Rudolph after Murphy's end, Harry basically almost went dark side there. And if Sonya hadn't volunteered to get beaten up by him, Dresden might have crossed a line that he could never uncross, even though Rudolph totally would have deserved it. And then as a response to the whole mirror mirror thing, uh, Sword of Rome 11 comments, Interestingly, when Harry was smack talking the vamps, one part of his GTFO of my town line was, Return forthwith to your place of origin, or to the next convenient parallel dimension. Coincidence? Nah, that's just a line Ray says in Ghostbusters to Gozer. But is it really? Is it just that? Is it ever just that? Especially with Jim Butcher. Man knows the difference between the right set of words and the almost right set of words. And I think in this situation, especially with a hint for the next book, it's totally the right set of words. Anyone else notice that both Harry's wedding and Listen to Win's exposition visit are both scheduled for one year in the future? It's probably when the next book's going to come out. That makes a lot of sense, given that there's usually a one year in-universe between each book. Not every single book. Peace Talks and Battlegrounds, for example. But at least in the beginning, it did seem like there was about a year in between each book. Harry started out as a 25-year-old kid, and now he's basically a 45-year-old man. Hasn't been reliably true for a while now. Changes to Ghost Story a few minutes or a few months, depending on how you count it. Ghost Story to Cold Days, few hours. Although the first couple chapters take months to play out. Cold Days to Skin Game, a little over a year. Skin Game to Peace Talks, maybe two to three months tops. 
case talks battleground a few minutes if that okay okay this person broke it down a lot better than i just did i'll give him credit for that right but he suggests a return to the formula peace talks and battleground don't really count since they'd be the same book except the publisher wouldn't let jim do it Ooh, why there was something posted on this recently it's not that they wouldn't let him, but rather that the book would be large enough that they couldn't print it in-house. It was a choice between delaying the release to accommodate outsourcing the printing, or splitting it into two books so that they could print it in-house. It's kind of sad that a major publisher has let their printing capacity degrade to the point where it's a choice that had to be made. But my understanding is that they did let Jim make the choice. I kind of got those vibes, because Peace Talks is very much set up, and then Battleground is just payoff after payoff after payoff. Honestly, Battleground's a little bit exhausting, and by a little bit, I mean the entire book is exhausting. There's just so much action and you have to take breaks. It's almost as if it's too much too fast sometimes. But again, I think that when you look at Peace Talks and Battlegrounds as being one book instead of two books, it was worth a five year wait. I'm now strongly flashing back to Turncoat and Rashid telling Harry in a troubled tone that it wasn't his time to stand against the White Council yet. That time is nearly upon us. Ooh, excellent callback. I forgot that one. Me too. I think Rashid is one of those characters that doesn't get enough screen time in the series. I know he has an important job, but at the same time he's super mysterious and he's one of the few characters that we haven't fully explored yet. I know that there are some theories that Rashid is actually Harry, but from the future. I don't know if that's the case, but if Harry ended up getting sentenced to be the defender of the world for like eternity, that would probably be pretty fitting. I mean, it wouldn't be any different from any other day, except instead of Chicago it was everywhere. Plus then we'd get a time travel book. And yes, I know time travel is breaking one of the laws of magic. Harry don't care anymore. Finished it all over the night and struggling to stay awake at work. I really love Mab and Harry's interactions. I think Harry is starting to earn her respect and he's starting to realize that she's not the evil fairy queen he thinks she is. Just calculating and willing to sell her soul to protect the world. There's actually something really noble in that idea. Because even if she ends up destroying herself or destroying who she was when she first took the mantle of the Winter Queen, she still is doing something good. So basically the evil character was good the entire time. So apparently there's a shitload of Starborn running around. Dracul the Destroyer, Harry Listen, who I'm assuming didn't bite it just from getting some dirt tossed on him. I don't even remember who Listen was. I kept reading the book and thinking, is this Listen to Wind? And then I realized that Listen to Win was still on the good guy's side. So then I had to back off a little bit and think about it. Related to that, Mab implying Harry's starbornness is grooming him to become an immortal. Don't stroke his ego any more than it has to be. Poor Murph. Oh my god. This was probably the biggest WTF moment of the entire book when Murphy died. Fuck Randolph. Fuck Randolph. Fuck Randolph. Thrice I bind you. Fuck Randolph. Everyone seems to be hating on Nidademus. I really liked it. Made a lot of sense to me given his core motivations and clear stockpiling of power weapons. Getting a coin to use as his trump card feels very in line with his character, especially as the scale of conflict keeps ramping up. That's what I was thinking too with Marcone. At first I felt kind of blindsided, like they threw it in at the end just to make sure that he survived the scene. But it really makes sense, because I feel like Marcone would do anything to get power. He definitely has his own vision, and he definitely feels like what he's doing is making Chicago better than if somebody else was in charge. But I also think that that's sort of what draws people to power that ends up consuming them. And I don't know if it's going to work out for him. The White Council is about as useless as the Ministry of Magic. Yeah, no kidding. They've had their head up their asses for, like, longer than the series has been a series. That said, excited to see what route Harry takes to form a vanilla magical alliance in public. He's going as the Wizard of Chicago. Wonder if he founds a legit Great Council or expands the Paranet into an Accord signatory. That would be really cool. I do really like how Harry ended up letting people with smaller magical talents learn them and learn how to be safe with them. Especially after the beginning of book two where Kim Delaney met her end trying to contain that one werewolf dude in the circle. Harry seemed really really guilty about that. And I feel like him bringing the Paranet together is sort of his redemption arc for that. That was one thing that I wish that we had seen more of in Peace Talks and Battlegrounds. The Paranet just kind of hit out at max, and I don't really remember them doing anything. Except for letting Karen run out and, well, you know how that ended. Harry talking about going back to school equals some interesting power-ups in the near future. I like the theory that chondritis is basically wizard puberty. You know, because all 45-year-old men go through puberty. Or at least they act like they do. 
and Harry's control over his magic is about to get much more refined. The start of peace talks, he has no idea what's happening, becomes he's continuously using conjuritis for Looney Tunes references. Lara and Harry is going to be a fun dynamic, especially considering Molly's blatantly obvious feelings for him. I thought that Molly kind of let him run free in the end. I feel like that scene in the car was Molly letting him go. But I think this person is saying that that means feelings. Granted, I've never been good with my feelings, so I could be totally wrong on this. With Murphy out of action permanently, slash till the end of the BAT. What is the BAT? If you know what the BAT is, tell me in the comments below. I submit Thomas as the next Knight of Love, especially if they take him to hunt down Justine. Oh, that was a good twist. I didn't see that coming. Harry's winter night mojo is still tons of fun. Bob's the best. Duh. That soul gaze broke my heart, man. Empty house is so much worse than empty night. The empty house metaphor was a little bit out of nowhere, but surprisingly powerful. The repetition of it killed me. The whole scene was very well written. She was his home, and she is gone. It fits so beautifully with how in changes they almost started, and were together. And that's the time he didn't have a home. That entire scene broke me, and it made me cry, and I don't want to talk about it. But yeah, all the feels. My takeaways. Mostly not really covered elsewhere. Lacuna is a tooth fairy. Somehow I miss that. And I'm a bit dense from time to time. Poor Molly. She knew from the beginning what Mab had planned for Lara and Harry. It's why she was so snippy to Lara after the Battle of the Kraken. Yeah, I don't know if she's trying to let go or if this is going to turn into love triangle. Honestly, I don't think Lara would mind. She's not the type to really get attached like that, especially if it's a political alliance. I think that as long as Harry kept his other relationships on the down low, she'd give him a pass. Especially because if things got out of hand, well, Harry would be much less valuable to her. So he needs to get his fun elsewhere. Of course part of Athanu's armor was made of Mordite. How do you smell that? I do not have an issue with Marcone wielding a coin. I'd have expected it to be Lashiel once again, given that she's willing to work with her host. I was not expecting it to be Thorm to Namshiel, or that entity would be willing to be partners with a host. I don't really know a lot about Thorm to Nashiel. I really want to know how Michael and Charity found out about Molly. Me too. Maybe it's like when you're a teenager and you think that you're all smug and suave and can get away with anything, and really it's just your parents wanting you to have a bit of fun and not let on that they know that you're breaking the rules because then they'd have to punish you. I think it's probably a more wholesome version of that because, you know, carpenters. The next time that Harry sees Murphy will be in Mirror Mirror. That's gonna be a fun scene to read. Wait, do they already have spoilers for Mirror Mirror out? I thought that Guard made it pretty obvious that the only way that Murphy would ever come back to Earth is after she had been forgotten by everybody. I really would like to see Murphy. I think at the beginning of the series, Harry envisioned her as an angel when he looked at her with his sight. Maybe that was some sort of foreshadowing. Maybe she's gonna end up fighting with her dad and the other uh, sort of supernatural detectives in the ghost world. I think that there's more possibilities than the book is letting on. Who saw that twist with Lara at the end coming? Not me. Not in the history of ever. There are a lot of Starborns running around. And they have some big roles to play, apparently. Yeah, I don't really know how the Starborn thing has come into play. I think that that's something that's more been explained near the end of the series, and I don't really know why it's important yet. If you like what I do, hit the subscribe button and join the Calf Nation. We'd love to have you. I post bookish videos about twice a week, and at least one of those videos a week is going to be a Reddit discussion video, so if you love these, definitely subscribe. And if you think that I suck at this, tell me in the comments down below and I will try to suck better next time. Bye!